Right, well this question of whether there's one cycle or each cycle is part of many is, you know, it's not possible to resolve it. There's no way to know. Sort of the way I interpret these things like Noah and Atlantis and the things you mentioned is that this one unique transcendental event that is still ahead of us somewhere in the planetary future is the cause of all the visionary and mystical anticipations that, you know, Atlantis didn't rise and fall in the past. It, ro it will rise and fall in the future. And all of these things which we place in the distant past are actually echoes from this transcendental <coughs> object that, uh, and what history is, is the unraveling through the intercession of the Tao, I mean, you could call it the unraveling or the witnessing to the unraveling, since I don't think it depends on us, but the, the unraveling of the secret that there is, uh, you know, that history moves toward a resolution, a transcendence of itself. It can't be like this forever. It hasn't been like this forever. This is something so new, it's like yesterday people stopped, you know, beating each other over the head with fruits. And uh, then this, you know, a 15, 25,000 year march toward some kind of self-generated cultural omega point where technologies, imaging of our own neural capacity, metaphysics, all of this stuff is just turns incandescent as we, and yet, you know, people say nothing is happening. Right. Mm. That it's all totally ordinary, that it's just humdrum and ho-hum. Because they can't see the past, you know, they can't, they, they're so... They have no idea how different this is. Exactly, yeah. This they is think different. They, they think this is every day, always has been, and that's like, I'm always marveling at how we're able to do things. It's like, cause I can see a ways back to where you, like I said, we were just banging each other with sticks or rocks or, or, or rotten food or whatever. Now we're doing this in this kind of space with these kinds of pieces of, even that was considered Stone Age uh, five years five ago. Five years ago, right. I consider it a marvel. I mean, I wish it would be faster too, but all this stuff is, <laughs> is pretty amazing. Francis. Have, have you at any point in all of this uh, uh, become uneasy about the determinism implied? Well, I've thought about it a lot. My, oh, here's what I say about that. An absolute determinism is one, impossible, and two, to be avoided at all costs. The reason is, if the world were absolutely determined, then thought doesn't mean anything. I am thinking, if the world is absolutely determined, then I am thinking the thoughts I'm thinking because I can't think any others. It's just determined. So that puts philosophers out of business, and since I sort of identify with that, why I'm very concerned to preserve free will, how I think <laughs> of what this is doing uh -huh. is <clears throat> the previous model of time was basically that what you had to worry about mostly was cause and effect. The effect of your activity on the world, keep that clean and move forward. Uh, what this idea is saying is that the topology of time is not a flat surface and that you can think of the Tao of your life as water, and it's moving ov over the temporal topology, the temporal landscape. But the temporal landscape is not a flat plain. It is, in fact, cut by mountains and uplifts and cliff systems, so that sometimes your life runs quickly and there is high novelty, and sometimes there is, uh, there are barriers and the flow is slowed. But the actual events which constitute the realization of the potential of novelty or its absence are freely determined. 
So in other words, here we have the chart and it's going along and it's flat and now there's a huge drop on a certain day and now we say, what do we know now? All, all we know is that on this certain day there's going to be a uh, shift toward the novel but we have no idea what the events will be that will fulfill this very generalized kind of prophecy. That's the problem. You, you keep saying, how do we know that this is really true and not just a marvelous conversational topic? The only way you can find out if it's true is to make a specific prediction that could not have been predicted any other way. You see something coming that nobody else sees. And then say, aha, I told you so. And then, just, you know, then you know you're right. 2012. Well, I guess that will be 2012. You have to, the shift, you see, you can predict shift, but if someone demands that you predict content, then I don't think they understand how it works. If you could predict content, then the world would have to be seen as extremely highly determined. So, so what you predict is shift. And then if we can get an agreement on what that means before the test happens. So, you know, all theories, this is a good general piece of information that somebody passed on to me and I'm forever grateful. If you want to, if somebody's pushing an idea at you and you want to know just how reasonable and fair and so forth they are about this idea, then this is the question you ask. Under what circumstances would you agree that you are wrong? You see? Now, Freudians have never answered this question. Marxists are incapable of responding to this question. There are no circumstances under which Marxists and Freudians would feel constrained to abandon their theories. Uh, when you apply that question to this uh, theory, um, you get levels of retraction. What if nothing happens in 2012 at all? Well, um, a, a hardline position would be that the wave was simply calibrated wrong that only one thing was wrong with the theory, the end date, everything else still holds. Uh, some of you may know there's a wonderful book called uh, When Prophecy Fails. <laughs> Have you ever read this book? It's by two Stanford sociologists who um, infiltrated a flying saucer cult in Utah. This woman's husband had died and she had begun getting messages a few months after his death and then a few months after that Ouija board messages and a few months after that he handed her on to Commander Gamma who was an extraterrestrial in orbit around this planet who was planning to intervene for the good of mankind and she gathered a very small group of people around her including these two Stanford sociologists. And the messages became more and more intense, and finally it became about a meeting, and that it would occur at dawn on a certain day in a certain place in the Utah desert. And these people were just in a lather over this. <laughs> and, uh, you know, great excitement. They told no one. They told no one and prepared and fasted and finally they drove to the place where it was to happen and as dawn rose over the desert uh, nothing happened and they waited around until the sun was beating down and then went back to headquarters to regroup well they decided that they had obviously gotten the message wrong and that this was the fallacy of being secretive, that they hadn't had enough people helping them figure out what was going on. So they voted and decided to immediately call a press conference and announce 
the entire thing and their faith was redoubled and they saw then that now they were going to get the aid of interested parties and publicity and so forth and so on. This is called the disconfirmational crisis and uh, it, uh, it happened for Christianity as well because of course Christ said this generation will not pass away before I will return among you. And, you know, people, the, the first hundred years of Christianity were just totally apocalyptic. But then the hotheads were swept away and the managerial types and the MBAs got hold of it and said, let's squelch all this end of the world talk and do some serious investing. <laughs> and, uh, so my, my position vis-a-vis -vis that is, uh, I will be 65 years old a month before December 22nd, 2012, and at that point I will retire, <laughs> and uh, I'll be perfectly happy to see this described, you know, these histories of scientific ideas that have paragraphs that say things like, the later 17th century saw a flowering of bizarre and eccentric scientific <laughs> theories of which so-and-so's is the most baroque example. They can put me and Jose on the same <laughs> shelf. <laughs>